Greetings, nerdlings. Today, we're going to be talking about levels of ecological organization and biomes, as well as the plants and animals that live there. So earlier on in the year, we talked about levels of organization. We started way at the beginning of the year when we talked about biomolecules. Now, we're going to talk about levels of organization starting with the organism and ending with the biosphere. So in increasing order, meaning getting larger and larger and larger, or more and more broad, we go from organisms, organisms come together to form populations, populations come together to form communities, communities come together to form ecosystems or biomes, and all of the ecosystems and biomes on Earth are called the biosphere. So examples of organisms would be a mushroom, which is a fungus, an amoeba, which is a protist, a flower, which is a plant, a walrus, which is an animal, and bacteria. So groups of the same species or of the same organism that live in an environment at the same time are called a population, or they form populations. So here you can see a population of bison or buffalo, a population of swans, a population of flowers, and a population of fish. So how do organisms live together? Well, they form communities. Communities are when populations of different species of organisms are living together at the same time in the same place. So as you see here, we have populations of zebras, lions, buzzards. We have populations of giraffes. We have populations of grasses and things you might not be able to see, such as bacteria and fungus. All of those together form a community. So all of the communities living in an area form an ecosystem. Ecosystems are composed of abiotic factors, a means without, and biotic is referring to life and biotic factors, which are the factors of the environment that are living. Examples of biotic or living factors in an environment would be all of the plants, the animals, the fungus, the bacteria, and the protists living in that area. Examples of abiotic factors would be the soil, rocks, temperature, moisture, sunlight, and water that you could find in that ecosystem. While we're talking about ecosystems, a lot of times we're going to talk about a plant or an animal or a bacteria or a fungus's habitat, as well as their niche. A habitat is the address or where that organism lives. The niche is going to be the role or the job that that organism plays in that ecosystem. So for example, fungus and bacteria play a very important role in decomposing different types of materials. Bacteria also plays a very important role in the nitrogen cycle that we'll learn about soon. So, as a reminder of all of those levels of organization that we've learned this year, we're going to start out with the most specific to the most broad. So going way back to the beginning of the year when we talked about biomolecules. So, we have molecules such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids that come together to form organelles. Organelles are those tiny little organ-like structures in the cell, such as mitochondria, chloroplasts, endoplasmic reticulum, nucleus, and the list goes on. Organelles working together make up a cell, such as a plant, animal, fungus cell. Cells come together to form tissues, such as cardiac tissue or muscle tissue. Those tissues come together to form an organ. So cardiac tissue would eventually form the heart, which is the organ. Organs form organ systems. So all of those organs working together form an organ system. So the heart with all of the blood vessels and the lungs and the arteries and the veins all working together will form an organ system. Organ systems all working together are going to form organisms. Organisms, all of the same species living together in the same area at the same time, 
are going to form a population. Populations of different animals, plants, fungus, and bacteria living together at the same time in the same area will form a community. Communities form ecosystems or biomes, and then those ecosystems or biomes form the biosphere. Bio meaning life, and sphere meaning big round ball, which is where all life is contained on Earth. So the next topic we're going to discuss are all of the biomes on Earth. So we're going to start out with the freshwater biome. Freshwater includes our rivers, lakes, and streams. You're going to find freshwater fish. You might find various waterfowl such as ducks. Sometimes you see seagulls. Uh, you might see some pretty waterfalls, plant life, and that funky thing there. That's called a duckbill platypus. So some of the adaptations that plants have for the freshwater biome, or they have anchoring roots to help keep them anchored to rocks or substrates. They also have flexible stems so they can move with the flow of the water. Animals have webbed feet. So the ducks have those webbed feet that help them swim. Some of them have oil-coated feathers to help keep them dry and warm, and some have waterproof fur. The next biome is my absolute favorite biome, and it is the marine biome. It contains tons and tons of different organisms, has a very high biodiversity. It's home to all kinds of fish and coral and whales, which is my favorite. Do we have a whale? Which is my favorite. Um, dolphins, walruses, all kinds of different species of algae. That is where the marine biome houses all of those organisms. So, some of the adaptations that plants and animals have in the marine biome. Plants have anchoring roots, kind of like freshwater biome, to help anchor them to the substrates, especially plants that are in the tidal zones where we have water coming in and out. They have stems with floats, so they might have little air bubbles that kind of pull those plants up to the surface, which allows those plants to be exposed to sunlight so they can photosynthesize. Again, they have flexible stems to allow for the changing of the tides and movement of water so they don't break. And they're also adapted for salt water as well as fluctuating water levels. Animals, a lot of them have nostrils that have migrated to the top of their head such as various dolphin and whale species. So when they come up to breach, so they'll come up, whoop, their blowhole or their nostrils have actually moved up to the top of their head, which makes it easier for them to breathe as they reach the surface. Most animals have hydrodynamic bodies, meaning that water flows around them very, very easily. They're also good at salt regulation, so they can excrete salt very well. And they have some type of buoyancy regulation. Some have blubber. Sharks have extremely oily livers. And a lot of types of fish have air bladders or swim bladders. So next, we're going to talk about the tropical rainforest. This has a high, high biodiversity. Tons and tons of plants and animals and fungus and bacteria and protists live here. It's characterized by lots of rain lots of sunlight, it's always warm, and again, it has a ton of plants and animals. We have beautiful trees with canopies, vines, and that crazy girl right there that looks a lot like me. So some of the adaptations that plants have to the rainforest are prop roots. They have broad root systems for anchorage. They have lots of branching canopies. Some plants can actually absorb moisture from the air. And that helps them not have to compete with other plants that have better roots, so they can actually absorb their water from the surrounding environment. And some of them are poisonous to help prevent from being eaten. Animals have long prehensile tails. Prehensile means that it can grasp things. So like an elephant's trunk is prehensile, it can actually grasp things and move around. They have really strong, long limbs. They have camouflage, and again, some of them have poison, such as the poison arrow dart frog. The desert. This is characterized by extremely low biodiversity. 
It's very hot and very dry, and it's usually cold at night. Very, very few plants and animals live here, and most of the animals that do live here are very small, and a lot of them are reptiles and have scales. So plants in this environment need to conserve water, and one of the ways they do that is having needle-like leaves. This also detours other organisms from eating them, because they're pretty sharp and they hurt. They also have waxy cuticles to help keep water in. They have very deep tap roots to help reach the water source. Very short life cycles. And they also have seeds that stay dormant for long periods. Now the reason for that is they want to have seeds that spring up or germinate whenever conditions are favorable. And conditions might not be favorable for months or even years. So they stay dormant until conditions are optimal. Animals are nocturnal, which means they come out during the night to help conserve energy and not be overheated. They also have extremely efficiency excretory systems, meaning that their kidneys work very well to conserve water and excrete salt. A lot of them have light coloration for their desert environment. Some of them migrate, and again, there are lots and lots of reptiles that live there. So we're going to talk about two types of grasslands. The first one is the savanna, the typical one that you'll find in Africa. It has a dry season and a wet season. It's always warm and it has a lot of fires. It's also home to many herbivores. This is where you see all of the organisms from the Lion King. We have our giraffes and our zebras and our wildebeests and our lions and our hyenas and all of that. The second type of grassland is a temperate grassland found in the Midwest. So the temperate grassland is also characterized by a mid-biodiversity. It too has a dry and wet season. It has cold summers, cold winters, and hot summers. It also has frequent fires in the dry season. And it too houses lots of herbivores. So some of the adaptations that plants have for the grassland are they have most of their biomass in the roots below the surface, which means that even if there's a massive fire that destroys the top of them or they're grazed upon by herbivores, they still have the bulk of the plant in the roots and they can regrow easily. They're also adapted to frequent wildfires and grazing. Animals have specialized teeth. The herbivores have grinding teeth that are flattened, and the carnivores have very sharp shearing teeth so they can rip and tear flesh. Animals in the savanna are also adapted for speed. Think of a gazelle or an antelope. Think of how fast they run. We also have the predators that have adapted to the speed of their prey. So we have extremely, extremely fast lions and tigers. And this is also an example of coevolution. The predators and the prey have coevolved together with speed. A lot of animals migrate and some animals are adapted to digging. Next, we're going to explore the temperate deciduous forest. This has a high biodiversity, and these have four actual seasons. They have warm summers with rains, cold winters with snow, and they have deciduous trees, which means they have trees that shed their leaves. Those are those gorgeous trees that you see in the fall that turn brilliant colors of orange and red and yellow, and then they fall to the ground. And if you remember from our plant lecture, we have specific hormones that cause this to happen. It houses many mammals, insects, and birds. Some of the adaptations that plants have in this biome are that the trees shed their leaves to conserve energy. Low-lying plants have short growing seasons. Some of the adaptations animals have are to migrate or hibernate, and some of them store food for later. So a lot of times you'll see chipmunks and squirrels gathering all of their nuts and hiding them away in trees to store for later. We're next going to talk about the coniferous forest, or the taiga. This is characterized by a mid-biodiversity, and these are those evergreen trees, the ones that have the needles and they also have cones, which is why they're referred to as a coniferous forest. They're typically found in the north, and they're much drier and cooler than the temperate forests are, or the deciduous forests. There are many mammals and birds that live here, as well as insects. So plants in this environment have needle-like leaves. 
This allows them for maximum utilization of sunlight, it helps to prevent grazing upon them, and it also helps to shed snow so the branches don't break. Animals in this environment have thick fur to help them out in the winter to keep them warm. Some hibernate while others migrate. Some of them also employ the use of camouflage, and again, some of them store their food for later. The tundra. This is characterized by low biodiversity. It's cold year-round here, it's dry, and you'll also find a layer of permafrost. Most of the time, you're only going to see lichens and mosses and mostly migrating animals. So very low shrubbery, this is a reindeer, this is a crazy Miss Butcher on a glacier, and as you can see back here, we have lichens and mosses that are gathered around the rocks behind me. So adaptations that plants have in this area Plants have a very rapid growth because they only have a small window of time to grow, bloom, and reproduce. They also have shallow roots because they can't penetrate past that permafrost. Animals have thick fur or blubber. They also employ the use of camouflage and they hibernate or migrate. So this concludes our talk about our levels of organization and our biomes. Stay tuned for trophic levels. I'll see you guys next time.